Dr. Naga actually gave me a wonderful opportunity to be here chairing uh, this session uh, with my great uh, longtime friend on the other side of the planet over there, Professor Richard Johnson, who is the Thomas Bird Professor of Medicine at the Division of Nephrology at Colorado in Denver. I'm very happy that he is with us today. And as usual, he's going to take us deep in the abyss of nephrology and tell us unknowns. He's going to talk about unknowns as always he does, but he makes, he brings light to this abyss and he always has discoveries. Please, Rick. Thank you very much. I'm just really delighted to uh, be, be able to give you this lecture. Uh, Tarek is one of my best friends in the whole world. Egypt is one of my favorite places in the entire universe. And I'm very happy to have this opportunity to speak to you. I realize it's late in the day there. It's still early here. Uh, and so I will uh, try to go through this talk and uh, quickly, and but thoroughly. So there is a mysterious epidemic of kidney disease that is occurring in many parts of the world. And it has been a mystery, and it's one that everyone is trying to find an answer to. And many people have many ideas. So today I'm going to summarize some of, the, of this um, research. And um, I, I also, we, we had a New England Journal review on this earlier this year. I have a few disclosures. I have grants, uh, but we'll move on here. So here's the, the yellow circles are really where the epidemics have been proven to be. There's epidemics going on in Central America and in Mexico, in India, and in Sri Lanka, in Thailand. Uh, there, there are reports that suggest that it could also be in Florida and in Southern California, in the Central Valley. Also, there are some reports, not as uh, strong, uh, for it being possibly present in Egypt, as well as the Sudan. So we, this is a very relevant talk, and I'll be very interested in the questions that you may raise, and on your thoughts about whether this disease is present in your country. We're going to begin by talking where it is definitely known, and that is along the Pacific coast in Central America. The people who are developing chronic kidney disease are young. They're typically people working in sugarcane, but they can be working in other occupations. They present with asymptomatic elevations in serum creatinine low-grade proteinuria, and if they're biopsied, they show chronic tubulo interstitial nephritis with some glomerulosclerosis. So they have kind of a, an inactive urine sediment. The urine may have a few red cells, a few white cells, a little bit of protein if present at all, but they have an elevated creatinine and they progress. Some of them have low serum potassium, high uric acids. The serum sodium can be high or low or normal, and the serum phosphate is occasionally low. Some uh, women have also been reported to develop this disease as well as children, but it's mainly the manual, the people working out in the fields, and there've been over 30,000 deaths now. Now, just like there is uh, an epidemic in Central America, there's also a very well-documented epidemic going on in Northern Sri Lanka. It has been going on at least since the early 90s and probably before that. It affects men more than women, but women are more co uh, commonly affected than in Central America. It has the same presentation, and it's also associated with hypokalemia and hyperuricemia, or elevated uric acid, and there's about been the same number of deaths. 
But the difference is most of these people are working in rice paddies. And there's also an epidemic going on in India, in the area of Andhra Pradesh and Odisha. And these are, because this region also has been called Udanam, some people call it Udanam nephropathy, but it's basically looks very similar. They present with asymptomatic creatinine elevation, uh, and they have some of the same features. This has led several groups to suggest that these epidemics are linked and could be driven by similar factors, but we don't know for a fact. And there are subtle differences in kidney biopsies that people can note, but it's really a chronic tubular interstitial disease in all three cases. Now, there's some evidence that heat stress is involved. I, I don't want to rule out toxins, and we're going to be talking about toxins at the end, but we're going to start with heat stress because that is a common denominator. Most of these people are working in a very hot environments where they start early and before it gets too hot, and they work maybe it's high, highly exertional. So like in Central America, the average age is 30. They're not obese. And many of them will cut six to six and a half tons of cane per day. And it's been shown that it's really the highest risk are the sugar cane cutters. And the more you cut, the greater your risk as well. This shows uh, a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, this is a temperature map. And what it shows is that the areas in red, where it's the hottest, seem to be along the Pacific coast. And these are exactly the places where the epidemics are. There's now an epidemic up here in Guatemala. There's epidemics along here in uh, Nicaragua and El Salvador, Costa Rica. Uh, and so this is one of the reasons that people have been thinking heat is important. Another argument is that the people working in the sugarcane fields that are working at higher altitude in, in Central America, because it's this, and there are some sugarcane uh, fields that are at higher altitude, they have a lower frequency of CKD than the ones at sea level, even though they are in the same pesticides. So this kind of argument has led to the idea that temperature is important. Here's another very important slide. It shows that the temperature, that what we call the, the wet bulb temperature index, and it increases in the morning. By 10 in the morning, it's beyond what, it, what is thought to be good for working. Yet these people are working till three in the afternoon. So they, many of them are working in situations where the Occupational Safety Health Administration of the United States would say they need to be they need to be taking a lot of time uh, breaks, which they don't uh, do. So there's no doubt that heat stress could be involved, but if it is, how would it cause kidney damage? So is there evidence of that? Well, you know, classically we think of heat stress as causing, you know, volume deplete, causing volume depletion and dehydration. And there is some evidence some of these guys aren't drinking enough. They have headaches, dry mouth. Some of them get low grade temperatures, difficulty breathing, dizziness. Uh, and there have been occasions where people have passed out in the fields. So dehydration and heat stress kind of can go together. Another thing that's very interesting is now there's at least six studies, some I've been an author on, in which people have measured the kidney function in the morning before they go out in the, into the sugarcane field, and then when they come back from the sugarcane field and in the afternoon, and their creatinine goes up, and they can show signs of, of developing acute renal injury every time they go into the field. Now, 
this could just be pre-renal, right? And it may not necessarily mean that there's kidney damage, but some of them are associated with elevations in urinary NGAL and other biomarkers suggestive that there's true kidney damage that's occurring. And so one of the favorite theories is that there's recurrent acute kidney injury, very subtle, that occurs when they're working and get behind in heat stress. And over time, that leads to the asymptomatic rise in creatinine. We actually tried to look at this to see if heat could cause CKD through dehydration. So what we did is we took this lovely young mouse and he see he's asking for water right here. And we took this these mice and we put them in little heat chambers for 30 minutes every hour for about eight or nine times in the, during the day. And then they were taken out in between where they could rest and then they would go back in and then they'd come out and rest. One, of, one group got to drink water every time it came out of the chamber and the other group, we didn't give them water until the night. So there's one group that hydrated during the heat and the other group hydrated after the heat. So one group actually got quite dehydrated during the course of the day. And here's what we found. We found that the group that had delayed hydration, it's not really dehydration, it's delayed hydration, developed tubular damage, fibrosis, this brown stuff is collagen, that was greater than that, those animals that hydrated during the day. So if you got, if you got your water right after you got heat, your kidney function stayed normal. But if you had delayed hydration, you got into trouble. Now these are mice, but it sort of uh, exemplifies what we're talking about. Well, people started looking at this, uh, scientists started looking at this in these workers, and they started linking the kidney damage to heat stress. And uh, we, one of the thoughts was, as they started studying this, was it wasn't so much the dehydration, but the body temperature. And we actually started thinking about that. And there is a thing called heat stroke, which I'm sure everyone knows. But heat stroke it usually is a generalized phenomenon where you get fever and disorientation and muscle aches. But acute kidney injury can occur with it. Now, interesting, there's two forms of acute kidney injury. There's one that's associated with classical heat stroke, like the uh, older person who loses their air conditioning and they go into, they develop renal failure. And the person who's exercising, and the ones that exercise, they tend to get rhabdomyolysis. But interestingly, the group that doesn't exercise, they can get acute kidney injury without rhabdo. So you can get it either way. And there's great overlap between the two. So you can be exertional and develop acute uh, heat stroke and renal failure without, without um, uh, rhabdo. And interestingly, um, the, 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 uh, you know, you can show that during the times when it's really hot, the heat stroke increases. Well, sometimes these patients or these uh, sugarcane workers will actually end up in emergency rooms where it looks like they have heat stroke. They'll have fever, they have white cells in their urine and, and muscle pains. And, and there was a group in Baylor that biopsied 11 of these guys. And what was interesting is they don't have ATN like you think, but rather heat stroke causes an inflammatory disease. It's, it's actually high temperatures activating inflammation associated pathways like inflammasomes and you get white cells in it. So it's a different type of AKI than just simple ATN. And this is actually more consistent with this tubular interstitial disease because there's often inflammation in it. It isn't just ATN that keeps recovering. And interestingly, there are reports of heat stroke leading to CKD. This was an old paper from 1967 from South Africa, where there were miners 
and these guys go into these hot mines and they can get um, heat stroke. And this guy's temperature got up to 106. He had AKI, he did not have rhabdo. He had, uh, he ended up on dialysis. He came off dialysis, but acutely he had that same kind of lesion of acute kidney injury with inflammation. And later he had the same kind of lesion with the CKD. So this is sort of arguments. Now, some of you know that for the last decade or more, I've had an interest in uric acid. And I was thinking that uric acid might be involved in this disease as well. And that's because heat and exercise can cause subclinical rhabdo with the release of DNA that increases serum uric acid. And then if you're dehydrated, you tend to acidify the urine because your aldosterone gets turned on and it acidifies the urine. So if you had high urine uric acid and low urine volumes with urine acidification, you could get crystals. And, and so we, we were thinking that that could also be involved besides this heat stroke. And when we looked at the across shifts from the morning to the afternoon of these workers, we found that the serum uric acid went way up during the course of the day consistent with this, and the urine pH fell. And when we looked in the urine, we found crystals in about one in six patients or, or workers. So we think that that could also be involved, that there could be crystalluria. Some of these guys actually complain of passing sand in the urine uh, and feeling, you know, they have dysuria and they, they urine culture is negative. So maybe, maybe this is contributing to. Well, there's also the issue of climate change. And could that be one of the reasons for this epidemic? As you know, temperatures have been going up, but only about one degree. And so the temperature change doesn't seem to be enough. But what we forget about is that there's, uh, there's uh, swings in temperature. And actually, I'm going to go back. Um, even though the temperatures have gone up one degree, the, the heat waves have gone up dramatically more. And the heat waves uh, are, are, can last for a week or longer. And so uh, it was very interesting. This is kind of a cool story. Um, I was getting urine shipped to me in Denver from Central America, from workers uh, and morning and afternoon workers. And normally the urine uric acid was, you know, fairly normal range, but they were getting crystals about uh, one in six subjects had crystals in their urine, especially in the afternoon when they got dehydrated. And then one day we got all these urines, but instead of getting 20 of them, we only got like eight. And the guys that sent them to me said, hey, we couldn't get a full sample. Uh, you might want to just skip this one. But I ran it anyway, and the urine, uric acids were sky high, and the, there were crystals in all eight. And when I looked up the, the uh, temperatures from that region, the peak, the absolute peak temperature for the entire year was the day before. And so what happened was this was a heat wave. And you know, the workers, they bring in the amount of water they think they need. And if they don't know there's a heat wave, they may not bring in enough water that day. And then if it gets super hot, they get caught. And I think that's what happened here. And it turned out the reason there were only eight instead of 20 was some of them didn't come to work that day because they knew how hot it was going to be. So I think heat waves are important. And when there is a heat wave, here's the change in temperature. It's just going up by one degree, but the number of heat waves goes up by a lot more than that. And so now they say that 75% of heat waves are due to uh, climate change. And then when we started looking at heat waves, we found that they linked with where these epidemics are. This is a heat wave map in India. And these are where the ep ep epidemics are being reported, but not every place. Like this, there's a little epidemic going on here. Well, if, he, if heat's the cause, then hydration should be able to prevent it. 
And here's a study that was done by a PhD student quite some time ago, 2007. And he had these people where they, they, when they were drinking, they were drinking about five to six liters a day and their creatinines were going up during the course of a day, pretty significantly. And that was on when they were drinking usually. And when he asked them to dr increase their water intake to 10 liters a day, the creatinines improved. Um, now they were just told to drink and he didn't actually monitor how much they were drinking, but it, it's interesting how this practice changed uh, the, this acute kidney injury. So this has led to big hydration trials in Central America and they've done this. And this is one of the studies that was just published but I want you to see that even with hydration, some groups are still developing kidney disease, especially the cane cutters. So despite hydration, 27% of the cane cutters still got kidney injury. So that tells me that they're probably something else. And maybe there really is some toxins that we haven't figured out. Well, one thing about sugarcane is they burn it and they burn the sugarcane fields to burn off the green leaves, to kind of burn away and chase away the snakes that live there and the, and the rats. And when they burn the cane, the cane itself doesn't fully burn. And then the next day they come in and they cut the cane where the sap is still present. So this is a practice and you can see that it puts a lot of pollutants into the air. And they get coated in this when they're cutting the cane. So they get coated in the suit. It's all over their face, their nose, their ears. And when they cut the cane, the ash comes off and you get this big puff. And I actually got to go down to Nicaragua last December. Tarek, I gotta tell you this. And I got to go out there and cut some sugar cane myself. And I got pretty dirty. And I the, the soot uh, and the ash got all over me because of this. Well, when you look at the ash, it's filled with silica. That's the main component. Now, silica is kind of the metal, the, uh, an element that's common in rock and dust and dirt. So it's not so surprising. Well, we know that silica can cause a disease called silicosis, but that's with the crystal silica. This is, turns out to be nanoparticle silica. And nanoparticle silica doesn't cause silicosis. The crystals, it's, it's much smaller. And when you breathe it, it, it gets stuck in the lung a little bit, but not much. You can actually get into the circulation. And there's some data out there that silica nanoparticles, if you breathe them, you might actually get them to your kidney. So to, do, to test this, Carlos and our group gave silica nanoparticles and put them in the nose of these mice so that they inhaled them. And he did this for like five weeks. And when he, when he looked at the kidneys, he was amazed. He found that there was scarring in the kidney and the kidney function got, went down. There wasn't much protein area. And he found that he found it. developed fibrosis with collagen. collagen. And when we look at the spectral stain, we the silica particles. And we did electron microscopy to find the silica as well. I, I hear an echo. Do you guys hear the echo? Okay, for some reason I hear an echo. But anyway, and we could find silica by mass spec in the kidney. We did find some inflammation in the lungs, but the animals actually did fairly well. And um, they didn't complain of respiratory problems to me at least, but they looked okay. And, uh, and actually sugarcane workers develop some pulmonary symptoms as well, but it's not very considered very significant. So this raised the question, could silica nanoparticles be participating in this kidney damage? And we were able to get kidney biopsies from these patients. And when we looked in their kidneys using this very special hyperspectral imaging, we found what looks like silica particles in the kidney tissue. And when we did special electron microscopy and mass spec, we could find evidence for silica in some of these kidney tissues, especially in the lysosomes 
of the proximal tubules. And uh, it was quite significant. And by mass spec, it looks significant. We're still working it up. We don't, we're still trying to figure it out. One of the problems we have is we have to study um, kidney biopsies from these areas that are not uh, chronic, you know, CKDU. We have to find like diabetic nephropathy and, and see if, if silica is in those biopsies. Because maybe, maybe it's, there's silica in everybody's biopsy. I don't know. We have to figure that out. But we can also show that it's getting into their urine. And we can show that uh, when they, uh, you know, that, that you can find these nanoparticles in the worker's urine. And interestingly, the burning of sugarcane has been increasing, and the amount of sugarcane biomass that's being released is increasing. And here's where the epidemic was reported. And interestingly, people also burn rice husks. Uh, they burn the rice to help um, fertil improve fertilization. And they do that a couple times a year. So it turns out that silica particles are getting into the water and it could get into the well water, for example. And here's um, Sri Lanka showing the amount of rice husk that's being burned and getting into the atmosphere. So in conclusion, there are all these epidemics of chronic kidney disease that are occurring throughout the world. There's one in Thailand now for sure. Uh, heat stress is certainly part of the story. Uh, it, it's part of all the stories. It, it must be involved to some extent. But hydration and shade provide only partial protection. So there probably are other causes, maybe toxins, our preliminary studies suggest that silica in the ash from sugar cane and rice could be contributing to the disease, perhaps by inhaling it, perhaps by drinking it. We just don't know. And our work is preliminary. We need more, more studies. And we, are, we just got a big grant from the NIH, uh, and we can help fund a little bit. Uh, some studies with you guys. If you think you have someone who may have this disease, we can look at the kidney biopsy for silica. We can look at the kidney biopsy to see if that could be present. We and uh, we can. All we need is a it sent to us in a blinded way. Um, you so you don't tell me the name of the patient, and we can work with you. We can even have uh, collaborative projects with you. Papers. So more studies are needed to confirm these exciting findings, and I appreciate your attention. These are the individuals who've been working on it. Uh, Jared Brown is a silica nanoparticle expert who just happens <laughs> to be at this university. And Carlos has been my, is my brother-in-law and also has been working with me for many years. Miguel is, of course, my lead scientist, and Josh Schaefer uh, is also a silica occupational guy. So we're very much uh, excited about this, and I, I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you very much. And we can stop sharing. I guess I can do that. And I can take questions. Thank you very much, Rick, for a very interesting talk and, uh, and a new vision, as usual, about the silica. I wonder, were you biopsying controls together with the silica kidneys? Yeah? So, so, so far what's happened is we had kidney biopsies sent to us from the Karolinska Institute, and they had published several papers with the local uh, nephrologists. And I, uh, our grant is now to work with all these local nephrologists. Very early on, the question you asked came up, you know, what about kidney disease from other parts, uh, you know, from El Salvador that are not this disease. And we did get a, some biopsies sent to us, and we had very mixed results. Some of them look like there's no silica in it, and some seem to show silica in it as well as diabetic nephropathy. Now, what we're trying to figure out is is the silica contributing to the diabetic nephropathy? Uh, I mean, is it that they have two conditions 
Or is it that the silica is getting into the kidney but not causing so much problem and, and, uh, and we're tricking ourselves? Now, the only, so what we're doing now is we're giving actual sugarcane ash to rats through their nose to see if they get kidney disease from the actual ash. Because before we gave nanoparticles that we bought. But it, it, it's true. We have to figure this out. I, I would hate to write a paper that it's silica and then have to um, come back and say, you know, we didn't do all the correct controls and, and we have a problem here in Denver. Uh, so, uh, but it looks promising. I do think that this is probably playing a role. I, I, um, the fact that Carlos got animal got disease in his animals with nanoparticles makes this very attractive as a, as a mechanism of disease. And we now have better ways to measure the silica than ever before. We finally have a way to really quantitate it. And so we weren't quantitating, it was very qualitative before. But now we can actually quantify the amount of silica in the tissue, which we couldn't do before. Hi, Richard Johnson. I am Salah yes. Mega. I haven't seen you since the last ASN Colorado, Denver. I miss you guys. Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, are you sure that the silica is coming from the cane sugar you analyze it? Or yes. from the diet of the fish, uh, the habit, diet habit of this people? Yes, I can tell you it does come from the sh sugar cane. And that's, uh, I didn't show the data, but um, I, I mentioned that I'm working with a silica expert. There aren't many in the world, but one of them lives here in Denver. And he has developed a special method where he can look at the nanoparticles themselves. And what he did was uh, he can look at the distribution and when he looked at the sugarcane ash, it gives a very kind of uh, characteristic distribution. You know, it's like this uh, Gaussian curve and it centers around, you know, 200 nanometers or so. And then when he looked in the human biopsies of the sugarcane workers, he got a match. So it's, it's for sure it's from the sugarcane. It's not just, and we do have other biopsies where we can find silica, but it's not the match at all. And we also see a slightly different pattern in India. It, the, the particles are bigger, so it's it's not from sugarcane, it's probably from something else, I don't know. Uh, so we, we can now uh, do something we couldn't do when, you know, when the, we, we couldn't do six months ago. Now we have a way to actually prove it. It's pretty cool. These guys are good. One day I'm going to come back to Egypt. And I hope one day you guys can come to Denver. Tarek, I'm going to get you to Denver. We hope, visit. We hope to but see you. Right now is here. not the time, and though. Enjoy diving. Enjoy diving with Tar. Yes. Oh, yes. Anyway, I miss Egypt. Uh, I miss you guys. I want to thank you very much for uh, listening to my talk. Uh, and I look forward to, to more, more interactions with your group and with all of you. And I wish you well. Those were beautiful talks I listened to earlier. Thank you for being with us. Have a good day. Yeah, thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye.